Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So before we start with the sermon today, I want to see how many people are wearing their wristbands. Today. <coughs> you know, not not too bad. More more per capita, I think, than the first service. So you guys you guys are, are, are winning that. So anybody want to share your experience with uh, the uh, your new complete free life this week? Uh. Too much. Too much. Yeah, change it a lot. Yeah, to be honest with you, this is a fresh wristband because mine broke from the frequent changing. What's that? I have a black and blue mark. Black and blue mark. <laughs> well, yeah, you can, you can snap it at your own risk, you know, so. All right, yeah. I didn't have anything to say. I what? didn't realize everything I said was a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how much. You complain, <laughs> don't realize it. Yeah. It's not safe to do it when you're mad and driving. Switching. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that out too because, you know, as I shared last week, that is one of the things I complain the most about is traffic. And here I'm like driving with my knee, switching the wristband, and it's uh, it really prevents you from complaining because um, <laughs> you have to move the wristband or it doesn't work. Anybody else? Want to share it, Ruthanne? You want to share? No, no I'm bad. Like for for those of you who weren't here last week, uh, we we gave everyone a one of these uh, yellow wristbands that say "Spirit" on it to uh, um, help curb our complaining. And so, anytime you complain, basically you switch uh, the wristband to the other wrist, so you attribute the physical movement to the act of complaining, in hopes of making you complain less. And uh, it, it worked for me this week as, uh, as I went about my week. I found myself uh, about ready to shout out a complaint in traffic. And then I said, wait, you know, um, be patient. You can get through this. Don't complain. So that's great. Well, if any of you who work here want a wristband or you guys just like got rid of your wristband after the first day and want to retry, there's some extras out there. So feel free to grab one. Um, so let us begin uh, with our message this morning, and let's start by uh, going and turn, take a Bible out in front of you and turn it to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And as you're doing that, uh, let's uh, say the text together is printed in your bulletins. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are to many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. So 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27 is what we'll be looking at uh, primarily today as we talk about being a steward of our times and talents. So starting at verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of one body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of men. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if a ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have, uh, may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So has anybody seen the, the show uh, Downton Abbey? Oh, yeah, a few people? Okay. I was calling it Downtown Abbey for the longest time. And it 
just rocked my world. And, uh, my wife said Downton Abbey. I'm like, no, sweetheart, it's Downtown Abbey. Yeah. <laughs> if you were wrong. Yeah. yeah, that's usually what happens. Um, so I, I recently watched an episode of the show, uh, Downton Abbey, and uh, um, for those who aren't initiated to the series, basically it's uh, set in the fictional Yorkshire country estate of Downton Abbey in, in England. It depicts the lives of the aristocratic Crawley family and their servants, with great events in history having an effect on their lives. For example, one of the episodes I saw had the Titanic sink. And they were reading about it in the paper, and they had some sort of relatives on the Titanic, and so it affected them deeply. Um, it affected the scope of their uh, family, in a way. Um, anyway, the episode in question uh, that, that I saw, a potential suitor of the Crawley daughter, an heir of the estate, came to visit the animal. But he did not come from a, a cr aristocratic beginnings. So he resented being served. Uh, he hated being served tea. He didn't like his valet. The valet was the guy who would help, help you dress, you know, pick up your cufflinks and tie, tie it for you, that sort of thing. And he, he didn't like being served tea, and he didn't like being assisted in his dress by his valet named Mosley. Anyway, after inadvertently insulting Mosley's job by demeaning him a little bit, uh, the man goes to Mr. Crawley and requests that Mosley be relieved of his services. Uh, because he does not need help getting dressed which I thought was a reasonable request. But Mr. Crawley replies in a way that, that I did not, uh, did not expect. He responds, you must let poor Mosley do his job. Imagine if you were in his position, a valet who wasn't allowed to be a valet. We all have jobs to do. You, me, all the servants here. We all have our roles to play here on hand. Do not strip Mosley of his. The body of Christ is about unity, but is also about differences. Different people working together in harmony. In Downton Abbey, clearly these men come from different areas of life. They have different statuses in the community. Yet their roles are important. They give them meaning. Mr. Crawley was essentially saying, embrace your differences. Allow him to serve you. In fact, you serve him in return by allowing him to serve you. One issue that comes to the surface in working through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is, is how quick after the extraordinary unity, community, and fellowship we experience in the season of Christ's birth, we succumb to divisions uh, to which we have become accustomed, and with which more often than not we feel more comfortable. How soon after such a unifying moment as God himself entering human history by taking on flesh, do we return our concentrations again on the things that separate us? Now Paul here moves into one of his most well-known, memorable, and effective metaphors of, of Christian community in the image of the body. And the, word, the Greek word here uh, translated as member is uh, mele, and uh, it, it can also be translated as part or limb in certain circumstances. And while the term member makes sense in the context of Paul's argument for and support of the meaning of community um, and the Church of Christ, I do wonder if most hearers here is in the immediate context of the community in which Paul is writing, and here is even now. Really get Paul's radical claim in using this metaphor. Paul is not simply making a statement regarding voluntary church membership. Paul's message is a little more radical. Uh, Paul's message is that being a member of the body of Christ means an absolute out-and-out -out conjoining of one with the other, a brother or sister in Christ. To exist in, in division, to see only difference and not the unity, to demand one's own agenda without celebration of difference, is to entertain the, the notion of dismemberment. We will find ourselves cut off from the very source of our life, 
our existence. And in a way, our ability to be most fully who we are in Christ. To what extent are we able to live out fully our callings when we are not able to rely on and give support to others who live out theirs? Is it not true that we are called, that who we are called to be requires us to support our fellow members of the body of Christ to embrace and live out their callings as well as our so stewarding our times and talents not only involves us living out God's calling in our lives to serve Him, to love others, and His church as vital functionaries within the scope of the body of His church, but also to support our other members, our other parts, our other limbs, our other organs in their calls. To embrace our differences, to, to decrease our divisiveness and increase our unitedness by accepting differences between us as a product of God's design for His church. And if this is true, we see last week's message spilling over into, the, into this week. Last week we talked about being stewards of God's Word and, and negative actions such as, such as gossip can prevent a church from being good stewards of God's Word. And what is the root of gossip? Do you guys remember from last week? Complaining. That's why we have the wristband thing. It's trying to live a complaint-free life. Gossip is something that also hinders the stewarding of times and, and talents as well. Because oftentimes gossip involves complaining about other people. And these other people often have roles within a congregation that they lend their time and talents to. And it just plain stinks to give your time and your talents and have people talk behind your back about it. It's the worst. And for some, it makes you want to quit. Give up. Use your time for something that will be more appreciated. Use your talents in a place where, where they are recognized. And perhaps you're feeling that here today. Or perhaps you felt that in the past and can identify. If one member, one part, one limb, one organ suffers, Paul writes, all suffer together. Thus, when one is hurt through gossip or, or control or similar negative behavior, the whole body is injured in some fashion. And when the body is injured, there is always a need to heal. And this healing and restoration can only come through Christ, whose injuries and suffering we can identify with as members of his own body. For in one spirit we were all baptized into this one body, and baptism is, is likened to a death, a drowning, where we emerge from the baptismal waters regenerated and new. And just as we share in Christ's death, we will share in a resurrection like His, and if we share in His resurrection, in Christ we have the capabilities to overcome our differences, to transcend the walls that may, be, may come between us as differently gifted individuals, but essential parts of the whole. When we, heed, when we heed Paul's words, we are reminded of our interconnectedness as a community of Christ. The call in this passage transcends any and all differences that we try to put in place. It supersedes any, any barriers we try to build up between us and those who are different or, or have different gifts. And we certain gifts over others Paul's words here are deliberate in his claim of even-handedness, even-giftedness. When it comes to, to how and in what ways God chooses to work in and through our calls to faithful living. We all have our roles to play at Redeemer. And Redeemer has its role to play in the body of Christ. Just like in the story at the beginning, we should not seek to prevent anyone from, from serving in the area of their calling as children of God. It's our duty to cultivate that. To be a good steward of our times and talents is to use our gifts to further God's kingdom as the Holy Spirit leads and guides us. But also an essential part of our stewardship role is to help cultivate the gifts of others. We have all been given what is your role? In order 
to discover what your role is or spiritual giftedness is, oftentimes we administer spiritual gift surveys. And so today, as you came into the church, you were handed a spiritual gifts uh, inventory, um, and uh, we would like you to, uh, to take that. Not, not, not right now, please. But uh, um, you know, take it after the service if you want to. If you want to run through it real quick and turn it into us, or take it home this week and bring it back on Sunday, um, and, and put your name on it, and uh, um, you will be able to see from this gift that will help you and help the pastor, so that people are are put in in areas of help. At, that they're gifted in, and it will help you see, too, the areas that you're particularly gifted in. And maybe you're serving in an area that you're not gifted in, and, and thus you're miserable for serving in that area. I mean, because, let's be honest, people get roped into helping in a certain area sometimes, because we don't have anybody to fill that spot. And the pastor will come to you and say, hey, can you serve in this? And you're like, yeah, I want to be a team player, I'll serve in this, and it's something you, that's really not a gift that you don't enjoy. And this survey is meant to help you have, have confirmation of what your gifts are, and uh, that if you're not enjoying a certain area, you're, you're lending your time and talents to help in, then perhaps your spiritual gifting is us. And we'll figure that out. Let me give an analogy of this situation that helps me, and breaking everything down to a football analogy helps me. If you have a football team, and decide that you have too many quarterbacks. So you're going to make one of your quarterbacks play defensive tackle. Because you're short on defensive tackle. That's not going to work. Why? Because, well, the quarterback will, will get killed at defensive tackle. He won't be able to break through the offensive line. He doesn't have enough size, strength, and girth to, to do his job. As hard as he tries. And that's how it is sometimes with the body of Christ. Sometimes there are quarterbacks playing defensive tackle. And sometimes there are kickers playing wide receiver. Simply because they want to be part of the team. And the coach asks them to play in a particular position. We have need in this position. Can you fill it? And this inventory is designed to help you see what positions you're truly in. We truly have a gracious and mysterious God who relates to us through his son taking on the body, who gives us the picture of the church as an embodied bride with his various churches composing of different parts, and he comes to us in the sacrament, giving his body for us to take and eat. In this, he gives us the sustenance of his grace, which feeds our spiritual bodies, giving the body at large which shares in this gift at the altar together. People refreshed by the kingdom feast, ready for service, and ready to support others in their service. Ready to unite in perfect harmony. What better example is there of the body of Christ in perfect harmony than all of God's children participating in this kingdom feast? of Eucharist together. All of us sinners and saints, throwing our differences aside, ignoring our barriers, and coming to the altar together as Christ comes to us in his body and blood. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the spiritual gifts that you have lavished upon us as, as individuals and as a church. We pray, Lord, that as uh, everyone fills out these, uh, these surveys, that uh, uh, you will call us to the right areas of ministry that you would have us serve. We thank you, Lord, for, for the gift of the Holy Spirit that continually leads us and guides us in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now please rise as we join together in the singing of the hymn of the month. Follow welcome.